Hey, Thrilling Suspense fanatics, today we are continuing the posthumous collaboration between Clark Ashton Smith and William Breckford. Listen to the previous parts if you want to hear a bit about what a decadent, sinister, and bizarre person William Beckford is and what relation he has to these, the style, the working method of Clark Ashton Smith. We have been reading the episodes of Vathek. Uh, originally penned by William Breckford and continued by Clark Ashton Smith. Here are some important questions that I want you to keep in mind as we head into the third part. First, will you be able to tell when the prose switches from Beckford to Smith? Secondly, we know that the Princess Zulkaius has been addressing a lord. Who is that lord? Who has she been telling this story to? Or, by proxy, where are we, the listeners, situated as we hear this story? With that said, we are now going to get into the third episode of Vathek, the story of the Princess Zulkaius and the Prince Kalila, Part 3. Fully occupied with these projects, it was with heedless eyes that I saw our boat approaching nearer and nearer to the land of mountains. The rocks encroached more and more upon the border of the stream, and seemed soon about to deprive us of all sight of the sky. I saw trees of immeasurable height, whose intertwisted roots hung down in the water. I heard the noise of cataracts, and saw the boiling eddies flash in foam, and fill the air with a mist thin as silver gauze. Through this veil I perceived at last a green island of no great size, on which the ostriches were gravely promenading. Still further forward I discerned a domed edifice standing against a hill all covered with nests. This palace was utterly strange of aspect and had, in truth, been built by a noted Kabbalist. The walls were of yellow marble, and shone like polished metal, and every object reflected in them assumed gigantic proportions. I trembled when I saw what fantastic figures the ostriches presented as seen in that strange mirror. Their necks seemed to go losing themselves in the clouds, and their eyes shone like enormous balls of iron heated red in a furnace. My terrors were observed by Shaban, who made me understand the magnifying qualities of the palace walls, and assured me that even if the birds were really as monstrous as they appeared, I might trust in all security to their good manners, since the palm-tree climber had been laboring for over a hundred years to reduce their disposition to an exemplary mildness. Scarcely had he furnished me with this information when I landed at a spot where the grass was green and fresh. A thousand unknown flowers, a thousand shells of fantastic shape, a thousand oddly fashioned snails adorned the shore. The ardor of the sun was tempered by the perpetual dew distilled from the falling waters, whose monotonous sound inclined to slumber. Feeling drowsy, I ordered a penthouse to be affixed to one of the palm trees of which the place was full, for the palm tree climber, who always bore at his girdle the keys of the palace, was at that hour pursuing his meditations at the other end of the island. While a soft drowsiness took possession of my senses, Shaban ran to present my father's letters to the man of wisdom. In order to do this, he was compelled to attach the missives to the end of a long pole, as the climber was at the top of a palm tree fifty cubits high, and refused to come down without knowing why he was summoned. So soon as he had perused the leaves of the roll, he carried them respectfully to his forehead, and slipped down like a meteor, and indeed he had somewhat the appearance of a meteor, for his eyes were of flame and his nose was a beautiful blood red. Shaban, amazed by the rapidity of the man's descent uninjured from the tree, was somewhat outraged when asked to take him on his back, but the climber declared that he never so far condescended as to walk. The eunuch, who loved neither sages nor their caprices, and regarded both as the plagues of the emir's family, hesitated for a moment, but, bearing in mind the positive order he had received, 
he conquered his aversion and took the palm-tree climber on his shoulders, saying, Alas, the good hermit Abu Gabdol Gueman would not have behaved in this manner, and would, moreover, have been much more worthy of my assistance. The climber heard these words in high dudgeon, for he had aforetime had pious quabbles with the hermit of the sandy desert, so he administered a mighty kick on the small of Shaban's back, and thrust a fiery nose into the middle of his countenance. Shaban, on this, stumbled, but pursued his way without uttering a syllable. I was still asleep. Shaban came up to my couch, and— throwing his burden at my feet, said, and his voice had a certain ring in it that woke me without difficulty, Here is the climber. Much good he may do you. At the sight of such an object I was quite unable, notwithstanding all my sorrows, to help bursting out into a fit of uncontrollable laughter. The old man did not change countenance, notwithstanding. He jingled his keys with an air of importance, and said to Shaban in grave tones, "'Take me again upon your back. Let us go to the palace, and I will open its doors, which have never hitherto admitted any member of the female sex save my great Eglea, the queen of the ostriches.' I followed. It was late. The great birds were coming down from the hills and surrounded us in flocks, pecking at the grass and the trees. The noise they made with their beaks was such that I seemed to be listening to the feet of an army on the march. At last I found myself before the shining walls of the palace. Though I knew the trick of them, my own distorted figure terrified me, as did also the figure of the climber on the shoulders of Shaban. We entered into a vaulted apartment, lined with black marble starred with golden stars, which inspired a certain feeling of awe, a feeling to which, however, the old man's grotesque and amusing grimaces afforded some relief. The air was stifling and nearly made me sick. The climber, perceiving this, caused a great fire to be lit, and threw into it a small aromatic ball, which he drew from his bosom. Immediately a vapor, rather pleasant to the smell, but very penetrating, diffused itself throughout the room. The eunuch fled, sneezing, as for me I drew near to the fire, and, sadly stirring the ashes, began to form in them the cipher of Kalila. The climber did not interfere. He praised the education I had received, and approved greatly of our immersions, just after birth, by the sages, adding maliciously that nothing so sharpened the wits as a passion somewhat out of the common. "'I see clearly,' he continued, "'that you are absorbed in reflections of an interesting nature, and I am well pleased that it should be so.' I myself had five sisters. We made very light of Mahomet's teachings, and loved each other with some fervor. I, still, after the lapse of a hundred years, bear this in my memory with pleasure, for we scarcely ever forget early impressions. Thus my constancy has been greatly commended to me by the jinns, whose favorite I am." If you are able, like myself, to persevere in your present sentiments, they will probably do something for you. In the meanwhile, place your confidence in me. I shall not prove surly or unsympathetic as a guardian and keeper. Don't get it into your head that I am dependent on the caprice of your father, who has a limited outlook and prefers ambition to pleasure. I am happier amid my palms and by ostriches, and in the enjoyments of the delights of meditation, than he in his divan and in all his grandeur. I don't mean to say that you yourself cannot add to the pleasures of my life. The more gracious you are to me, the more I shall show civility to you and make you the partaker in things of beauty. If you seem to be happy in this place of solitude, you will acquire a great reputation for wisdom, and I know by my own experience that under the cloak of a great reputation it is possible to hide whole treasures of folly. 
Your father, in his letters, has told me all your story. While people think that you are giving heed to my instructions, you can talk to me about your Kalila as much as you like, and without offending me in any way. On the contrary, nothing affords me greater pleasure than to observe the movements of a heart abandoning itself to youthful inclinations, and I shall be glad to see the bright colors of a first love mantling on young cheeks. While listening to this strange discourse, I kept my eyes on the ground, but the bird of hope fluttered in my bosom. At last I looked at the sage and his great red nose that shone like a luminous point in that room of black marble seemed to me less disagreeable. The smile accompanying my glance was of such significance that the climber easily perceived I had swallowed his bait. This pleased him so mightily that he forgot his learned indolence and ran to prepare a repast of which I stood greatly in need. Scarcely had he departed when Shaban came in, holding in his hand a letter, sealed with my father's seal, which he had just opened. Here, said he, are instructions I was only to read when I reached this palace, and I have read them only too clearly. Alas, how wretched it is to be the slave of a prince whose head has been turned by much learning, Unhappy princess, I am compelled, much against my will, to abandon you here. I must re-embark with all who have followed me hither, and only leave in your service the lame Muzaka, who is deaf and dumb. The wretched climber will be your only helper. Heaven alone knows what you will gain from his companionship. The emir regards him as a prodigy of learning and wisdom, but, as to this, he must suffer a faithful Mussulman to have his doubts. As he spoke these words, Shaban touched the letter three times with his forehead, and then, leaping backwards, disappeared from my sight. The hideous manner in which the poor eunuch wept on leaving me amused me much. I was far indeed from making any attempt to keep him back. His presence was odious to me, for he always avoided all conversation about the only subject that filled my heart. On the other hand, I was enchanted at the choice of Muzaka as my attendant. With a deaf and dumb slave, I should enjoy full liberty in imparting my confidences to the obliging old man, and in following his advice, if so be that he gave me advice of which I approved. All my thoughts were thus assuming a somewhat rosy hue when the climber returned, smothered up in carpets and cushions of silk, which he stretched out on the ground and then proceeded, with a pleasant and contented air, to light torches and to burn pastilles in braziers of gold. He had taken these sumptuous articles from the palace treasury, which, as he assured me, was well worthy of exciting my curiosity. I told him I was quite ready to take his word for it at that particular time, the smell of the excellent viands which had preceded him having very agreeably whetted my appetite. These viands consisted chiefly of slices of deer spiced with fragrant herbs, of eggs prepared after divers recipes, and of cakes more dainty and delicate than the petals of a white rose. There was, besides, a ruddy liquor made of date juice and served in strange translucent shells and sparkling like the eyes of the climber himself. We lay down to our meal together in very friendly fashion. My amazing keeper greatly praised the quality of his wine and made very good use of it, to the intense surprise of Muzaka, who, huddled up in a corner, indulged in undescribable gestures which the marble reflected on all sides. The fire burnt gaily, throwing out sparks which, as they darkened, exhaled an exquisite perfume. The torches gave a brilliant light, the braziers shone brightly, and the soft warmth that reigned in the apartment inclined to a voluptuous indolence. The situation in which I found myself was so singular 
the kind of prison in which I was confined was so different from anything I could have imagined, and the ways of my keeper were so grotesque that from time to time I rubbed my eyes to make sure that the whole thing was not a dream. I should even have derived amusement from my surroundings if the thought that I was so far from Kalila had left me for a single moment. The climber, to distract my thoughts, began the marvelous story of the giant Gebri and the artful Sheridae, but I interrupted him and asked him to listen to the recital of my own real sorrows, promising that afterwards I should give ear to his tales. Alas, I never kept that promise. Vainly, at repeated intervals, did he try to excite my curiosity. I had none, save with regard to Kalila, and did not cease to repeat, Where is he? What is he doing? When shall I see him again? The old man, seeing me so headstrong in my passion, and so well resolved to brave all remorse, became convinced that I was a fit object for his nefarious purposes, for, as my hearers will doubtless have already understood, he was a servant of the monarch who reigns in this place of torment. In the perversity of his soul, and that fatal blindness which makes men desire to find an entrance here, he had vowed to induce twenty wretches to serve Eblis, and he exactly wanted my brother and myself to complete that number. Far indeed was he, therefore, from really trying to stifle the yearnings of my heart, and though, in order to fan the flame that consumed me, he seemed from time to time to be desirous of telling me stories, yet, in reality, his head was filled with quite other thoughts. I spent a great part of the night in making my criminal avowals. Towards the morning I fell asleep. The climber did the same at a few paces' distance, having first, without ceremony, applied to my forehead a kiss that burned me like red-hot iron. My dreams were of the saddest. They left but a confused impression on my mind, but, so far as I can recollect, they conveyed the warnings of heaven, which still desired to open before me a door of escape and safety. So soon as the sun had risen, the climber led me into his woods, introduced me to his ostriches, and gave me an exhibition of his supernatural agility. Not only did he climb to the tremulous tops of the tallest and most slender palms, bending them beneath his feet like ears of corn, but he would dart like an arrow from one tree to another. After the display of several of these gymnastic feats, he settled on a branch, told me he was about to indulge in his daily meditations, and advised me to go with Muzaka and bathe by the border of the stream on the other side of the hill. The heat was excessive. I found the clear waters cool and delicious. Bathing pools, lined with precious marbles, had been hollowed out in the middle of the little level mead over which high rocks cast their shadow. Pale narcissi and gladioli grew on the margin, and, leaning towards the water, waved over my head. I loved these languid flowers. They seemed an emblem of my fortunes, and for several hours I allowed their perfumes to intoxicate my soul. On returning to the palace, I found that the climber had made great preparations for my entertainment. The evening passed like the evening before, and from day to day, Pretty nearly after the same manner, I spent four months. Nor can I say that the time passed unhappily. The romantic solitude, the old man's patient attention, and the complacency with which he listened to love's foolish repetitions all seemed to unite in soothing my pain. I should perhaps have spent whole years in merely nursing those sweet illusions that are so rarely realized, have seen the ardor of my passion dwindle and die, have become no more than the tender sister and friend of Kalila if my father had not, in pursuit of his wild schemes, delivered me over to the impious scoundrel who sat daily watching at my side to make me his prey. Ah, Shaban, ah, Shamila, you, my real friends, why was I torn from your arms? Why did you not, 
from the very first perceive the germs of a too passionate tenderness existing in our hearts, germs which ought then and there to have been extirpated, since the day would come when not fire and steel would be of any avail. One morning, when I was steeped in sad thoughts and expressing in even more violent language than usual my despair at being separated from Kalila, the old man fixed upon me his piercing eyes and addressed me in these words. Princess, you who have been taught by the most enlightened of sages cannot doubtless be ignorant of the fact that there are intelligences superior to the race of man who take part in human affairs and are able to extricate us from the greatest difficulties. I, who am telling you this, have had experience more than once of their power for i had a right to their assistance having been placed as you yourself have been under their protection from birth i quite see that you cannot live without your kalila it is time therefore that you should apply for aid to such helpful spirits but will you have the strength of mind, the courage to endure the approach of beings so different from mankind? I know that their coming produces certain inevitable effects as internal tremors, the revulsion of the blood from its ordinary course, but I know also that these terrors, these revulsions, painful as they undoubtedly are, must appear as nothing compared with the mortal pain of separation from an object loved greatly and exclusively. If you resolve to invoke the jinn of the Great Pyramid, who, as I know, presided at your birth, if you are willing to abandon yourself to his care, I can, this very evening, give you speech of your brother, who is nearer than you imagine. The being in question, so renowned among the sages, is called Omultakos. He is, at present, in charge of the treasure which the ancient Kabbalist kings have placed in this desert. By means of the other spirits under his command, he is in close touch with his sister, whom, by the by, he loved in his time just as you now love Kalila. He will, therefore, enter into your sorrows just as much as I do myself, and will, I make no doubt, do all he can to further your desires. At these last words my heart beat with unspeakable violence. The possibility of seeing Kalila once again excited a transport in my breast. I rose hastily and ran about the room like a mad creature. Then, coming back to the old man's side, I embraced him, called him my father, and, throwing myself at his knees, I implored him with clasped hands not to defer my happiness, but to conduct me, at whatever hazard, to the sanctuary of Omultakos. The crafty old scoundrel was well pleased, and saw with a malicious eye into what a state of delirium he had thrown me. His only thought was how to fan the flame thus kindled. For this purpose, he resumed a cold and reserved aspect, and said in tones of great solemnity, Be it known to you, Zulchias, that I have my doubts, and cannot help hesitating in a manner of such importance, great as is my desire to serve you, you evidently do not know how dangerous is the step you propose to take, or at least you do not fully appreciate its extreme rashness. I cannot tell you how far you will be able to endure the fearful solitude of the immeasurable vaults you must traverse, and the strange magnificence of the place to which I must conduct you. Neither can I tell you in what shape the djinn will appear. I have often seen him in a form so fearful that my senses have long remained numbed, 
at other times he has shown himself under an aspect so grotesque that I have scarcely been able to refrain from choking laughter, for nothing can be more capricious than beings of that nature. O Multacos, perhaps, will spare your weakness, but it is right to warn you that the adventure on which you are bound is perilous, that the moment of the jinn's apparition is uncertain, that while you are waiting in expectation you must show neither fear nor horror nor impatience, and that at the sight of him you must be very sure not to laugh and not to cry. Observe, moreover, that you must wait in silence and the stillness of death, and with your hands crossed over your breast until he speaks to you, for a gesture, a smile, a groan would involve not only your destruction, but also that of Kalila and my own. All that you tell me, I replied, carries terror into my bosom, but impelled by such a fatal love as mine, what would one not venture? I congratulate you on your sublime perseverance, rejoined the climber with a smile of which I did not then appreciate the full significance and wickedness. Prepare yourself. As soon as darkness covers the earth, I will go and suspend Muzaka from the top of one of my highest palm trees, so that she may not be in our way. I will then lead you to the door of the gallery that leads to the retreat of Omul Takos. There I shall leave you and myself, according to my custom, go and meditate at the top of one of the trees and make vows for the success of your enterprise. I spent the interval in anxiety and trepidation. I wandered aimlessly amid the valleys and hillocks on the island. I gazed fixedly into the depths of the waters. I watched the rays of the sun declining over their surface, and looked forward, half in fear and half in hope, to the moment when the light should abandon our hemisphere. The holy calm of a serene night at last overspread the world. I saw the climber detach himself from a flock of ostriches that were gravely marching to drink at the river. He came to me with measured steps. Putting his finger to his lips, he said, Follow me in silence. I obeyed. He opened a door and made me enter with him into a narrow passage not more than four feet high so that I was compelled to walk half doubled up. The air I breathed was damp and stifling. At every step, I caught my feet in vicious plants that issued from certain cracks and crevices around the gallery. Through these cracks the feeble light of the moon's rays found an entrance, shedding light every here and there upon little wells that had been dug to the right and left of our path. Through the black waters in these wells I seemed to see reptiles with human faces. I turned away my eyes in horror. I burned with desire to ask the climber what all this might mean, but the gloom and solemnity of his looks made me keep silence. He appeared to progress painfully, and to be brushing aside with his hands something to me invisible. Soon I was no longer able to see him at all. We were going, as it seemed, round and round in complete darkness, and, so as not to lose him altogether in that frightful labyrinth, I was compelled to lay hold upon his robe. At last we reached a place where I began to breathe a freer and fresher air. A solitary taper of enormous size, fixed upright in a block of marble, lighted up a vast hall, and discovered to my eyes five staircases, whose banisters, made of different metals, faded upwards into the darkness. There we stopped, and the old man broke the silence, saying, Choose between these staircases. One only leads to the treasury of Omultakos, from the others, which go losing themselves to cavernous depths. You would never return. Where they lead, 
you would find nothing but hunger and the bones of those whom famine has aforetime destroyed. Having said these words, he disappeared, and I heard a door closing behind him. Judge of my terror, you who have heard the ebony portals which confine us forever in this place of torment, grind upon their ebony hinges. Indeed, I dare to say that my position was, if possible, even more terrible than yours, for I was alone. I fell to the earth at the base of the block of marble. A sleep, such as that which ends our mortal existence, overcame my senses. Suddenly, a voice, clear, sweet, insinuating like the voice of Kalila, flattered my ears. I seemed, as in a dream, to see him on the staircase, the banisters of which were of brass, a majestic warrior whose pale front bore a diadem, held him by the hand. Zulkaius, said Kalila, with an afflicted air, Allah forbids our union, but Eblis, whom you see here, extends to us his protection. Implore his aid, and follow the path to which he points you. I awoke in a transport of courage and resolution, seized the taper, and began without hesitation to ascend the stairway with the brazen banisters. The steps seemed to multiply beneath my feet, but my resolution never faltered, and, at last, I reached a chamber, square and immensely spacious, and paved with a marble that was of flesh color, and marked us as with the veins and arteries of the human body. The walls of this place of terror were hidden by huge piles of carpets, of a thousand kinds and a thousand hues, and these moved slowly to and fro, as if painfully stirred by human creatures, stifling beneath their weight. All around were ranged black chests, whose steel padlocks seemed encrusted with blood. Muffled hissings appeared to issue from under the lids of some of these chests, from others groans and cries as of indistinct voices and metallic clinkings. I thought that the voices were those of dives or afrits, rather than men. I shuddered and fled on, all the more precipitately because some of them had seemed to call me by name. The chamber was endless, and I saw that I had been mistaken as to its form. It enlarged itself before me, like the perspectives of a hall of ill dreams. Insensibly, and as if by the operation of some enchantment, it assumed a more frightful aspect. The marble pavement was now of that livid color seen in the flesh of bodies after death. Its veinings were dark as if blood had coagulated within them, and were interspersed with mottling such as would be made on human skin by the contusions of iron maces. Columns, higher than the monumental pillars of the old kings of Egypt, rose round me into gloom that the great taper was unable to pierce. A blue mist, such as might ascend from nether gulfs, wavered like a curtain before the removed walls, and the light flickered woefully in my arms as it met the dank, sighing exhaled by the subterranean reaches. I had need of all my resolution, and was forced to summon up the loved image of Kalila with all possible clearness before I could proceed any further. The vastness of the room, its dismal character and furnishings, terrified me more and more. A weakness seized upon my limbs and senses. The taper became an almost insupportable burden, and I could scarce uplift it to inspect the curious treasures piled about me. Notwithstanding this, I perceived that they were open caskets, overrunning with diverse jewels, with gold work wrought in the fashion of antiquity, and still untarnished, so that I felt sure, at first, that I had reached the treasury of Omultakos, the jinn to whom the Kabbalist kings had entrusted their wealth. 
but soon doubt came upon me as I began to note the hideous confusion that prevailed everywhere, the human finger bones and other charnel relics that were heaped without discrimination amid the precious stones or stored in separate vessels of graven silver as if they too had been of rare worth. I saw also that some of the larger caskets were really sarcophagi, such as were used by the Egyptians. They had been brimmed with skulls and the severed members of mummies and gold coins. Serpents, milk-white and wholly scaleless, crept to and fro, bringing in their mouths bright jewels or fragments of bone, which they deposited in certain receptacles that were not yet filled to the rim. A faintness, such as the dying must undergo, would have overcome me at the sight of these horrors and the musty odors which they emitted, but I was revived by an extraordinary apparition which, through the speed and brilliance of its descent from one of the topless pillars, I took for a moment to be the palm-tree climber. The apparition reached the floor in a flash, it rose up, and I saw my mistake. It was almost more than I could do to refrain from bursting into wild laughter, for the uncommon personage before me resembled, as much as anything else, a mangy baboon whose hair had fallen out in broad patches. His head and face, indeed, were altogether hairless, like those of the ancient priests, but the brows had been painted with coal to relieve their blank appearance and the same cosmetic had been applied in large mouches about the jowls. He carried at his side, from a girdle of human gut, a capacious and somewhat tattered pouch in the form of a stomach sack, from whose rifts unmentionable objects protruded. More amazing than all this, however, was the long tail, seeming to be on fire perpetually, which the remarkable being flourished in my face like a torch. Recalling the injunctions of the climber, I succeeded in smothering my mirth and maintained a strict silence. It was well, no doubt, that I did so. Omutalkos, for it was indeed the jinn himself, addressed me in a hollow and lugubrious voice that accorded somewhat strangely with his aspect, saying, Princess, you need no longer carry the immense taper whose weight has grown so burdensome to you. My tail, which burns with inexhaustible fire, will now serve as a flambeau for us both. He indicated a half-empty sarcophagus, in which, with expressive signs, he told me to deposit the taper, leaving it upright, so that the grease would not gutter upon the rare contents of that reliquary. Then he said to me, As a fitting reward for your perseverance in daring the shadows of the subterranean labyrinth, I shall show you the many treasures which have been amassed in this chamber during the eras of my custodianship. To the wealth of the Kabbalist rulers in itself quite prodigious, I have since added much that I prize peculiarly, Eblis, it is true, in his deep-lying halls, has been able to gather together a far more inclusive assortment of terrestrial riches, but I venture to assert that my collection, in some ways, is a little choicer than his. For example, in this casket you behold, among other remnants of former delight and beauty, a thigh-bone that once belonged to Balkis. He waved his tail, which flared brightly above the relic in question, and then, with a ludicrous and proprietary air, passed on to others. At one time, during our tour, he paused before a small box of green bronze, filled with a dark brown powder, and lifting a pinch of the powder to his nostrils, gave vent to prolonged and violent sternutations. When these had ceased, he remarked with much satisfaction, There is, to my knowledge, no sneezing powder more efficacious than the one I have just employed, which was obtained through the atomizing of the mummies of antique embalmers. My astonishment and disgust were mingled with a strange propensity to laughter, which I conquered again and yet again with much difficulty. 
Omultakos, in a most extensive circuit of inspection about the chamber, illumined for me with the unfailing light of his appendage an infinite variety of objects that testified to mortal corruption. All the while he discoursed upon their quondam ownership and their history in a fashion that was no less proud than funereal. He showed me, moreover, certain musical instruments which he himself had designed during hours of leisure. Among them I remember that there were lutes fashioned from the ribs and arm bones of women, and stringed with male sinews, and also that there were tabors of human skin that had a deep sonority. On more than one of these instruments he played a while for my diversion, and though I thought that the airs he exhorted from them were more than atrocious, I felt that it would be politic to commend rather than criticize his playing. In the meanwhile, I burned with desire to question him regarding the whereabouts of Kalila and the means through which we might again be united, but, mindful of all that the climber had told me, I restrained my eagerness. At last, Omultakos, who had led me on for a great distance between the columns and the sarcophagi, and had laid aside his unusual instruments of music, turned on me and said, Think not, O princess, that all my treasures are things which have come down from antiquity. In the recesses of this unfathomable chamber, objects of more recent date are also conserved. One of them, at least, will interest you. Be patient, and follow the illumination of my tale. With this adjuration, he conducted me to an open sarcophagus, gilded and carved from end to end with hieroglyphics, that stood a little apart from the others. In it, with unutterable horror and anguish, I discerned the form of Kalila lying as if dead, with a mortal pallor on his cheeks and lips and eyelids. I noted that the bosom of his raiment was torn and bloody. I hurled myself upon him and sought to revive him with kisses, but in vain. Omultakos, at this point, chose to interrupt my efforts by inserting the agile tip of his combustive tail between myself and the face of Kalila. He observed, in a severe tone, there is but one way in which the prince, your beloved brother, can be revived. The method, fortunately, lies at my immediate disposal. First, however, I will explain to you the presence of Kalila in this place. The emir Abu Taber Ahmed, in attempting to continue the heroic education he designed for your brother, sent him forth with a small retinue the other day to hunt the ferocious lions of the Nubian desert. These lions, approaching in unwanted number and with more than their usual rapacity, disposed the followers of Kalila and would have served the prince in like manner. If some of my subordinate jinns, who were watching over the expedition, had not intervened, unluckily they were too late to keep Kalila from being wounded almost to death by the talons of the beasts. They brought him here only a few hours since, and I have permitted him to occupy the sarcophagus of an elder pharaoh, though my wisdom has told me that the tenancy will be of brief duration, and that Kalila cannot be numbered among my permanent acquisitions. If you, Zulkaius, will consent to a very simple matter, I will give into your hand, without delay, a supremely sovereign restorative. Anything, anything, I cried wildly. I consent to whatever you ask, if only Kalila be brought back to life. You need promise only one thing, quoth Omultakos. Pledge your fealty to Eblis, the lord of the fiery globe, and the shadowy caverns. It is pledged, I replied hastily. Give me the restorative. Omultakos, with his apish fingers, began to fumble in the tattered pouch that hung at his girdle. I caught sight of certain highly nauseating oddments, from among which, presently, he produced a pale yellow fruit, having somewhat the form and size of a peach, and laid it in the palm of my hand. 
This fruit, he informed me, was grown in a garden which, without ever having beheld the sun, is more fertile than the gardens of Irem. If you squeeze it very gently above the lips of Kalila, a single drop of its juice falling down upon them will suffice to resuscitate him in all the bloom that you have loved so dearly. The fruit, after that, is yours to retain, but I trust that you will not be so careless as to devour it at any future time. If you were to do this, the results would be very surprising, since the action of the juice on those who languish at the gates of death and those who exult in the fullness of life is an altogether different thing. Scarcely heeding any of his words, I hastened to squeeze the yellow fruit above Kalila's lips, which were white as those of a cadaver. I was transported with joy when a living ruby returned into them beneath the dripping of the fluid, and the eyes of Kalila opened to give back my ardent gaze. He lifted his arms from the sarcophagus to embrace me, and I quite forgot the presence of Omiltakos. That personage, after a decorous interval, observed in a loud voice, I am sorry to break in upon your reunion, since I cannot do otherwise than approve and admire the fervor which animates you, but it is more than probable that I shall have, before long, another use for the receptacle you are both occupying. For that reason I shall conduct you to an alcove beyond my treasury. This alcove is fitted with comfortable couches that will serve your purpose fully as well. Kalila, rearing his head at the sound of Omultako's voice, perceived for the first time the remarkable baboon who had hitherto been screened from his view by my bosom. He, in turn, was no less amazed than I had been. However, heeding the injunction of our host, he got up from the sarcophagus. In low tones I begged him to repress the injudicious laughter that quivered visibly upon his countenance. We both followed Omultakos. As we went, I placed the yellow fruit in the bosom of my garment. Kalila, more impressed by the person of our guide than by the doleful surroundings, could not forbear commenting on the igneous properties of the tail which emitted showers of sparks on the gloom as the owner flourished it in his progress. He remarked to me, in great wonder, that the baboon seemed to experience no discomfort whatever from his unique process of combustion. Omultakos, who had overheard him, turned and said, No, young prince, that it is the nature of my tail to burn in this manner, and the sensation it affords me, in its degree, no more painful or extraordinary than that which women experience from the flushing of their cheeks, or men from an excitement of the blood. After a journey that appeared brief indeed, and which I could not reconcile with my former impression of the vastness of the chamber, we came to an open portal. The flambeau of Omultakos reared aloft, illumined for us a much smaller room with couches of golden cloth and dark draperies. My father would have loved the draperies, since they were entirely covered with hieroglyphics, but the hieroglyphics, which appeared to change altogether from moment to moment, would have maddened the sages who he employed. Here the jinn left us after lighting his torch. Here the jinn left us, after lighting with his torch the many lamps of brass and copper censers with which the room had been supplied. I thought that his departure was attended by an odd lack of ceremony, but recalled that he had come down from the pillar on the occasion of his appearance before me in a manner no less informal. Through the open doorway, Kalila and I continued for some time to see the luminosity that he made in his movements about the treasury. He seemed to be very busy, and we caught glimpses of certain peculiar assistants who were bringing in a new lot of treasures. But our joy in being together once more preoccupied us so fully that we paid little heed to these activities and were enabled to disregard, for the time being, their somewhat sinister import. Between our caresses, we asked each other a thousand questions, and told all that had happened to us severally since the date of our separation. 
Kalila was much dismayed when he learned the circumstances of my visit to the underground palace and the promise I had made, on his behalf, to the jinn. Alas, he said, I fear that all this has been prearranged and for no good purpose. The lions who attacked me were of supernatural size and fierceness. No doubt they were the very jinns of whom Omultakos told you, and after their talons had slain my followers and rendered me senseless, they brought me here. You, Zulkaius, through your affection for me, have entered the trap. However, let us try to forget this. No matter how dark and precarious our situation, we have at least the consolation of each other's society. All that I have done was nothing, I replied. Gladly would I pledge myself to Eblis a thousand times for your sake. In such converse, the hours went by, and we began to wonder at the long absence of Omultakos, who had vanished after a while among the pillars of the treasury and had not returned. He had left us without declaring his intentions as to our future destiny, and it seemed that he had forgotten us. Moreover, he had made no provision for us beyond lighting the lamps and censers. By the illumination that these vessels yielded, we began to remark the moth-holes in the figured hangings, and the great age of the couches, whose coverings might have been exhumed from palaces long buried in the desert sand. We noted, also, that the lamps and censers were overspread with verdigris. The fumes of the latter vessels troubled us, being both musty and aromatic, like the bombs that exhale from the cerements of the pharaohs. We heard, at intervals, equivocal and disquieting sounds, in a direction of which we were not sure. Together with all this, I grew faint with hunger, but there were no viands in the room for my regalement. At last, I remembered the fruit which I had placed in my bosom after using it to revive Kalila. Forgetful of the warning of the jinn, I drew it forth. I would have shared it with Kalila, but he, noting my hunger, declined. I devoured it greedily, finding a strange and spicy savor in its pulp. Almost immediately, I experienced a feeling of unbearable heat. An intense ardor of life rose within me, as if it would burst the confines of my heart. The chamber seemed to blaze with a light that was not that of the lamps. My senses burned with a confused delirium of desires. A madness possessed me, and Kalila was lost to my perception, like the shadows of the apartment. Then I thought that a ball of fire, hued with a thousand colors that changed momently, swam up and floated before me in the air. An extravagant longing seized me to possess the ball, and I sprang to my feet and tried to clasp it, but the globe eluded me and fled swiftly, and I, without heeding the cries of Kalila, pursued it. I ran through a small portal at the rear of the chamber and down a labyrinth of cavernous corridors which, save for the illumination of the globe, would have been altogether lightless. Intent only on overtaking the bright ball, I did not notice my surroundings or the route I followed. At last the light disappeared, leaving only a dim glimmer, like the afterglow of a sunken sun, and I came to the verge of a precipice. Far below, the ball receded, plunging into abysses from which the dismal and eternal roaring of lost waters came up to arrest me. However, in my delirium, I should still have followed the globe, if it had not seemed, after an interval, to return toward me from the depths. I waited, ready to seize it, but, as the light drew nearer, I perceived its true source. It was Omultakos, climbing nimbly from the gulf by means of the slight projections of the stone. In an instant, he stood beside me and said with an air of reproof, "'Princess, why this haste to fling yourself into the underground river that flows eternally towards the realms of Eblis?' The destined hour of your departure thither, borne by that doleful tide, is not yet at hand. Fortunately, I met your brother, who was seeking you in the darkness of the caverns, and, learning what had happened, I came without delay by another route than yours to intercept you. 
Kalila, in consideration of this act of succor, has plighted himself to the prince of the fiery globe, and the flaming hearts. Let us rejoin him, for I fear that he still wanders, lost and distracted in the darkness. In a sense, I am to blame for what has occurred, carried away by the duties of my custodianship of the treasury, duties that are often exigent. I forgot the obligations of a host, and failed to provide for your natural needs. If I had done as I should, hunger would never have prompted you to devour the fruit that gave rise to your delirium. My madness had abated. I followed Omultakos, perceiving as I went the horrors of the labyrinth of caverns to which the orb with the thousand colors had blinded me. At every turn there were scattered bones and skeletons which had belonged mayhap to wretches who had lost themselves in the maze and had perished of famine. Some of the skeletons lay close together, but I could not tell whether the intimacy of their postures had been dictated by human love or anthropophagism. Omultakos did not enlighten me upon this point, nor did I care to question him. At last we found Kalila, whose joy was little less extravagant than the delirium which had led me to the floating ball. I must provide more adequately for your entertainment, said Omultakos. Eblis permits me to keep you here a while as my guests. My subterranean garden lies not far away, and in it is a pavilion which you may occupy. Food and drink will be served regularly to you, and in plenteous quantities, and I trust that neither of you will be tempted, in view of what has occurred, to sample the fruit of my trees." He conducted us along a short passage, from which we emerged into an immense cavern whose roof was purple like the vault of night, and was starred with effulgent oars that resembled the planets and constellations. Here we beheld the garden of which he had spoken. It consisted of fantastic trees, heavily laden with diverse fruits and blossoms, and cunningly illumined by lamps which, very often, I could not distinguish from the fruits. In the midst was a small pavilion, built of marble mottled with rose and black. It was furnished with luxurious divans, and a table on which delicious viands and wines, like molten ruby and topaz, had been spread for our refection. Omultakos, after again assuring us of his hospitality, begged leave to excuse himself, and departed with the same celerity that had marked his former movements. In the pavilion he had placed at our disposal, Kalila and I dwelt for a period of time that neither of us could calculate. That period, however, in spite of certain forebodings, was the happiest we had known since our childhood days, when the emir was still content to leave us together without interruption. In that place there was no difference between day and night, for the lamps burned eternally amid the fruited foliage, and the star-like oars continued to sparkle ever in the vault above us. Often we wandered through the garden, which had a strange beauty, though we did not care, after certain indiscreet delvings, to examine too closely into its hidden particulars. The odors of the blossoms, richer than myrrh and santal, conduced to an agreeable languor, and since the gin supplied us with an infinity of savorous foods and wines more delicate than those of Persia, we were well content to leave his fruits alone. In the happiness of being together, and in transports renewed perpetually, we almost forgot the rash pledges we had given." nor were we troubled overmuch by the fact that the attendants who served us were invisible, and gave proof of their presence only by a sound that resembled the noise made by the flittering of great bats. And, also, for the most part, we found ourselves able to ignore a sullen roaring that pervaded the garden continually, seeming to issue from subterranean waters at a vague distance, and in a direction of which we were never sure. Indeed, we became so accustomed to the sound, mournful and menacing though it was, that it seemed to us little more than a quality of the silence in which we were sequestered. 
Our host, who was no doubt busily engaged with the care of his acquisitions and the treasure confided to him by the Cabalist rulers, failed to visit us again. We remarked his negligence, but, under the circumstances, we did not miss him. Alas, though we knew it not or strove to forget it, the malign forces of our destiny were always at work. Our sojourn to the garden of Omultakos was to have a frightful denouement. By virtue of the allegiance we had both pledged to the Lord of Evil, we were to share at the appointed time the fate of all others who have thus damned themselves irretrievably, and yet, in order to live again those happy hours, I and Kalila too would repeat the same bond without hesitation. Dream not that we repent. We were plighting other vows, as we had done a thousand times, and were seated upon a divan in the pavilion when the date of our perdition arrived. It came without announcement, save an insupportable thunder that seemed to reeve apart the foundations of the world. We were tossed as if by earthquake, the air darkened around us and the ground gave way. Clasped in each other's arms, we had the sensation of falling, together with the pavilion, into a deep abyss. The thunder ceased, the vertigo of our descent grew less, and we heard on every side the woeful and furious noise of rushing waters. A melancholy glimmering dawned about us, and by it we saw the pavilion had become a raft of serpents, plaited together in the fashion of reeds that was borne headlong on a dark, tumultuous river. The serpents, large and rigid as beams of wood, had preserved on their skins the black and rosy mottling of the marble, and they had formed themselves into a cabin around us, like the superstructure of the pavilion. As we went, they added a loud and sinister hissing to the sound of the driven waters. In this horrible manner, we were carried through unfathomable caves ever deeper toward the accursed realms of Eblis. Night surrounded us. We beheld no longer the least ray or glimmer, and, clasped tightly in each other's embrace, we sought by means of such contact to mitigate the noisome clamminess of the reptiles and the terror of our situation. Thus we seemed to go on for a length of time that was equivalent to many days. At last a light broke upon us, lurid and doleful, and the clamor of the river deepened with a thunder of mighty waterfalls before us. We thought surely that the torrent would precipitate us over some fatal verge, but at this point the serpents of our raft began to exert themselves, and swimming vigorously they landed us in the halls of Eblis, not far from that place where the Sultan Soliman listens eternally to the tumult of the cataract, and waits for the release that will come to him only with its cessation. After that, Preserving no longer the form of a raft, they re-entered the stream and swam back separately in the direction of the garden of Omultakos. Now, Lord, we await, even as you, the moment when our hearts shall be kindled with the unconsuming fire, and shall burn brightly as the tail of the baboon, but, alas, shall derive unutterable anguish like the hearts of all other mortals from that flame in which is the ecstasy of demons. The End What a wild and bizarre journey the third part of Vathek is. I don't yet own and have not read the first parts of the story, but uh, I have an 1880s copy of the of the Caliph Vethek on the way. It will be, I think, the oldest book in my collection when it arrives, and I'm not sure um, if it's something that's appropriate to get into here on the channel, both in terms of its length and in terms of uh, its content, given the sort of extreme uh, perverse nature of what we have just been through. However, in terms of um, what what it means to be 
a fan of Clark Ashton Smith and to be devoted to understanding more about his writings, I thought it was worth diving into. And I hope that all of you have enjoyed this uh, tale of, of decadence and really renunciation of Muslim faith in Vathic and the, the story of Zulkaias and Kalila. I really enjoyed it. And I'm wondering if you caught exactly when it was that Clark Ashton Smith took over from Breckford. If you didn't, uh, it was in the initial chamber of Omultakos with the serpents that are going from, uh, from sarcophagi to jeweled cups full of bones and other rare items. That is where our man Clark Ashton takes over. And you'll hear certain words like uh, celerity that are a dead giveaway. You know, Clark Ashton Smith loves to use the word celerity. He loves viands, aliments. He's into it. Anyways, now we are all more well-informed about the literary influences of Clark Ashton Smith. And I hope that you have enjoyed this journey and that you will like comment, subscribe, that you will share this video with other people who are in our community of prose, poetry, and pulp aficionadoship. And really, really, this is important, that you will buy Thrilling Suspense Fantasy Volumes 1 and 2, for while it is a great joy to read things, I am also striving to cultivate an audience for my own work which I see as heavily influenced by Clark Ashton Smith, by C.L. Moore, by Robert E. Howard, by the great writers of the 1930s, as well as the makers of Golden Age comic books. So, with all that said, I will see you with somewhat diminished frequency, which is to say about once a week going forward. All right, take care.